Welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us for the online discussion. Uh, my name is Brendan Brokes. I'm the North Puget Sound Regional Director, and I use he, him personal pronouns. I'd like to start off by asking you to join us in celebrating National Native American Heritage Month. Um, so I've been in this role for about two years now, and uh, I'm learning a lot every day. Uh, I've been with the department for about 20 years, and throughout that time, I've, uh, I've, I've been in the Habitat program and exclusively in Region 4. Um, welcome to the Digital Open House. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to hear directly from the people we serve and to talk about fish and wildlife conservation and management in our state and specifically in uh, Region 4, in our region, North Puget Sound. Um, I would see that I'm seeing that folks are still joining us, so we'll get started momentarily. And uh, I want to let you all know that we are recording the event and we will post it online afterwards. So for those uh, unable to attend, and you can always email us any questions if we don't uh, get to the questions you might have tonight. And the, I, in the chat will be uh, the email, uh, I believe it's director at dfw.law.gov and that will be posted in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to say uh, I'm joined tonight by our director, Kelly Suswin. Thanks for, for being here, Kelly. You bet. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, as you said, my name is Kelly Susan. I'm the director here at Fish and Wildlife. I use he, him pronouns as well. I'm really excited to be here. This really is an opportunity for us to connect with you on the local level. Obviously, as a uh, virtual format, we're open statewide, but we try to get around to each region. It's something we started a couple of, few years ago. Uh, hopefully we'll get back to doing this in person because it really is an opportunity to connect directly with you, the people we serve in the area where we serve you. I'm particularly excited tonight because we're going to introduce you to the entire regional management team here. Uh, our fish program, habitat program, wildlife program, and enforcement program. These are the folks that are actually running the operations here in your region. And when you call in and need to talk to somebody or you want to discuss how something's going in any one of those programs, these are the folks that are responsible for that here, direct delivery service and the local level. And so it's a great opportunity for us uh, to introduce them and get, for you to get to know them. And so I'm looking forward to the evening. All right, thank you, Kelly, appreciate that. Um, so thanks for joining us again. And uh, we're gonna start tonight on updates on just a few topics on work that's going on around the region um, in the department. So we're committing most of the time to uh, Q and A um, to help us with, I want to give our regional management team a chance to introduce themselves to you. Like Kelly said, these are the, these are the folks that are, are actually doing the really hard work. Um, they're, they're managing all the, the staff in the region that are, that are conducting all the fantastic conservation and management actions we're uh, performing. And so why don't we start off with Heidi, if you don't mind, please. And uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, good everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heidi Host. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Region 4 Office Manager. My amazing team includes our customer service staff who answer all your phone calls and emails. Uh, although our offices are still closed, we're really looking forward to seeing you in person soon. And next up, Fenner. Good evening, everybody. My name is Fenner Yarbrough. I use he, him personal pronouns, and I'm the Wildlife Regional Program Manager. Uh, the wildlife program, obviously we have wildlife biologists. Um, we also manage our lands. We have three wildlife areas and over 150 water access sites. Uh, we also have a variety of other staff members who do an incredible job from our private land staff um, to our water access, uh, wildlife area managers, restoration coordinators, you name it, we got it. And they all do an incredible job. So. If you have more questions after this, please don't hesitate to contact me. I think I'm all on the website, um, so please reach out. I will pass it off to Chuck. Thanks, Fenner. Uh, my name is Chuck Sambaugh Bowie, and I'm the Habitat Program Manager here in Region 4. I've been, I've been here for about a year and a half now, and I'm a, I'm a COVID employee up here. Uh, I manage uh, about 20 people, uh, uh, habitat biologists, uh, project managers, uh, inspectors, and we do uh, we do a lot of technical assistance, help landowners 
with their construction projects to protect fish life. We also do a lot of work in the restoration arena uh, for uh, salmon habitat, particularly in the estuary and both, both estuary and the uh, freshwater environments. We work with uh, forest practices uh, with DNR, uh, help landowners up there uh, protect fish. And, uh, and, and also we, we do quite a bit of work with local jurisdictions and helping them formulate their fish and wildlife ordinances uh, that they include in their comprehensive plan updates. And uh, we've got a great team here. Uh, we, we do a lot of work in region four and happy to be here tonight with you and, and get to share a little bit of what we do. And I'm passing it off to Captain Marstead. Thanks, Chuck. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jennifer Marstad. I use she and her personal pronouns. Excited to see everybody virtually tonight. Um, I'm the uh, Region 4 Enforcement Captain. I have been with the agency for about 20 years. I've spent my entire career in Region 4. I was a sergeant in Snohomish County before promoting to captain just recently here in December. Um, born and raised in this region, went to school here, so I'm very passionate about passionate about all things in Region 4. Um, currently in the, in the enforcement realm, we have five detachments spread out throughout the region. We have 31 officers. We're down four positions. Um, I probably don't have to explain to you what it, what it is that enforcement does, but just to, uh, to throw it out there, we are fully commissioned police officers, but of course our focus is uh, on all things fish and wildlife. So thanks everybody for joining us. If I don't get to any of your questions tonight, you can always get a hold of me at the Mill Creek office. And with that, I will hand it over to Edward. Thanks, Captain. My name is Edward Eliezer. I use he, him pronouns. I've been with the department since 1997 and previous to that served our country in the United States Navy. In my job as a fisheries manager, I uh, oversee all the fisheries and hatcheries from the Nooksack down to the Green and in the San Juan. So I know there'll be a lot of good conversation tonight. And if I don't get to anybody's questions, feel free, uh, reach out, send me an email and let's talk. So thank you for coming. All right, great. Thanks team, appreciate it. Okay, so I think maybe we'll start with a little bit of just some general um, information about the region and how it's organized. Um, our department statewide is organized into six regions um, and we are the North Puget Sound or region four. So we use that term interchangeably. Um, the North Puget Sound region includes Whatcom, Skagit, Snohomish, King, San Juan and Island County. So six county region. Um, our mill quarters are in uh, Milk, or our mill quarters, our headquarters are in Mill Creek, uh, and we have field offices in North Bend, um, Bellingham, and La Conner. There, there we are. There's the, the screen where the where the blue North Puget Sound. Um, and uh, again, always feel free to reach out to our customer service staff. Um, Heidi staff is great at answering the phone and they have the answers to virtually any question. And if they can't answer it, they will certainly uh, get that answer for you as quickly as possible. Um, they can be reached at phone or email. Um, and I think those are going into the chat. Uh, and so you'll, you'll be able to access those, that contact information there. Um, so with that, I think I'll pass it off uh, to Kelly for a couple of uh, quick updates. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, yeah, as we go around the state doing these, one, one of the things that we always want to, the folks always want to know about is what's going on legislatively and what's going on budget wise. Uh, so this year we're, we're heading into a legislature that's a short session. So we alternate between long and short sessions. This is the short session, the supplemental session. It's uh, only 60 days long. It's called the sprint for a reason. So we really try to be trim and, uh, and nimble with our, our, our ask at these short sessions. So we have four legislative bills going forward from agency requests. I'll just touch on each of them quickly. Hunting and fishing accessibility. This is really a, an assemblage of a number of hunting and fishing changes that we think will make it easier to enter into the, into the sports. These things include things like aligning our youth age. Right now we're at 15 and 16. We're gonna align them all at 16. This would provide a, a $20 coupon basically for your first hunting license after you successfully complete hunter safety education. 
Uh, it allows you to use a temporary license for our Lowland Lakes openers. That's one of our, not one of our, that is our biggest event of the year's biggest single event. And so we want to make sure that that's accessible so folks can get out there and get hooked on fishing. And, and we think then we'll be lifelong customers. We've got a great product to offer. So it's an assemblage of those types of things. Uh, the, ne the next bill is expanding eligibility for our ADA advisory committee. So right now we have an, a, a disabilities advisory committee and in statute, it specifies what types of uh, disabilities make you eligible for that committee. And uh, we serve a lot more disabled people than th just those specific types of disabilities. So we're going to open, we would like to open that advisory committee up to just being any, any, uh, any disability would allow you to be a member of that advisory committee. We're also going to expand it in that we've got a lot of great input from uh, caregivers of folks with disabilities that really know what it takes to get accessible uh, opportunities for folks. So we want to add a couple positions to that committee and, and have those be available for caregivers, uh, even if that you know, not just re uh, restricted to uh, disabled folks. Increasing access to recreational lands around the state. This is really a deal around our Discover Pass. Uh, we share the Discover Pass with parks and DNR. Right now, DNR can specify 12 days a year that the Discover Pass uh, is not required, so they're free days on DNR lands. Well, we would like to have those be free days on DFW lands as well. So this bill would do that, and that gives us an opportunity to sit down at the table with DNR and help figure out which, which 12 days would be optimal for our customers as well. And then lastly, something I think I hear a lot of uh, requests for and excitement for is uh, we're, we're strictly limited pretty much in statute on just how we can go about licensing. And we, we want to, and we know our public wants to increase electronic licenses and print from home licenses. And so we've had a bill that would allow us a little more flexibility in, in doing that. Uh, it does a lot of things. I think a lot of, uh, of our angling public and hunting public like it because it's a lot more convenient. It's helpful for us too because we get better real-time data so we can do a better job of managing just what harvest is going on. And then there's obviously the convenience point for, uh, for licenses as well. So those, that's it. They're, they're all fairly, I hope, I shouldn't say that, I want to jinx this, but they should be pretty straightforward. And I think even in a short session, we'll be able to, to be successful on those, or we sure hope we will. And I'll switch to budget real quick. Uh, and I, I will say that we were going to put in, uh, put on the chat, just access. So if you want to get more detail than, than this uh, blitz I'm giving you of, of information right now, you can, you can take a little more time to dig into to any of our bills and any of our funding. And we obviously have more funding requests beyond this, but we focus to those that, that have a particular impact here in region four. Uh, the first one is a $2.6 million request for freshwater monitoring. This is a gamut of, of monitoring. Basically, we need to be able to make sure we know how our fisheries are going, how productivity in our streams are going. We've got a lot of work to do out there. And this gives us the detail to have a more precise estimate of what's going on. Uh, this one in particular, I believe it's Lake Washington is, well, there's a few, a few streams and maybe Edward knows them better, but a few streams here in region four that are included specifically in this monitoring request. But it's really on that freshwater uh, element Mostly, uh, it's all around fisheries. $2.4 million for uh, monitoring game species. It, it mentions here mountain goats. It's actually mountain goats, bighorn, sheep, elk, deer, and even some turkey. So we do a lot of monitoring. Obviously, we want to make sure we're maintaining the, the, each species in a healthy state. Often, the money we get for doing this is a one-time money. And so you're putting on collars. Collars fall off. Batteries wear out. You have to recapture animals. So this is uh, $2.4 million to support that overall monitoring of, of wildlife and, do, and completing our surveys. You heard Chuck talk a little bit about the services we provide to local governments as they update their growth management plans. Those are uh, done periodically. We're coming to a big update for some central, some, some big uh, communities here in region four in particular. So King, Pierce, Nahomish counties, Kitsap as well. And this provides us with enough, uh, gives us a little more capacity to provide technical support for those, those communities, cities and counties as they go through that growth manning, management planning. 
we've got a long way to go on salmon recovery. And it's really important that we start with those basic critical area ordinances, those great, uh, those local ordinances on making sure that folks have salmon and salmon recovery in mind as they're updating those ordinances. They're in place for a long time and everything stems from those. Uh, the next on our list, I make sure I'm not skipping any, is building our salmon team capacity. So th this is again, uh, supporting our fisheries primarily. This up updates our quantitative ability, our scientific modeling ability. A lot of work goes into, I think it's, uh, I, I was astonished. I thought I had an idea when I came into the agency and I was astonished at just the level of detail and complexity that goes into this. And this is making sure this, this budget request would make sure that we have the capacity to stay on top of those things so we can continue to support our fisheries in a, in a responsible way. Forage fish spawning, uh, it's unfortunate we have to ask for this one. This is something we've been doing for a long time. It's basic monitoring those forage fish, herring, smelt, sand lance, et cetera, are really the base of the food chain for our, our salmonids. We've been doing this monitoring for a long time. The monitoring got shifted into the, the budget of another agency and then it went away uh, for us. And so we're trying to recover that monitoring it's another great opportunity. We use the Washington Conservation Corps for doing this. So it's a great opportunity for young employees and it's a critical data for us to continue that long-term database. Hatchery production and compliance. This is another huge book of work we have to do each year. So this, this would support our marking and also uh, pay our fees. So as we run hatcheries, we have discharge fees like everybody else, those fees are going up, everybody else that discharges. And so this would cover increased fee costs and also make sure that we can manage the marking. We mark millions of fish every year. It's, it's laborious work and we need to add a few folks to be able to do it. Uh, before folks ask, yes, we are going into a more automated version, but automated trailers are multi-million dollar investments and, and uh, boy, they're, they're a couple of years, they're, they're a long wait period to get them. And that's when you don't have a global supply chain issue. So, so we are doing both, but this is, this is uh, an effort to make sure we don't fall behind in that marking because it's critical for us. Uh, supporting safe and sanitary water access. Uh, boy, we've had a, fortunately, we've had a great increase in influx of users on state, on our state lands, all state lands. Uh, we had about 32 million visitors last year. And with that big influx of folks came a, a much higher maintenance level of work that needs to be done. Also rings, unfortunately, with it, vandalism and dumping, et cetera. So this is our effort to make sure, particularly our water access areas are clean and safe so folks can get out there and use them. We have about 33 wildlife areas in the state and over 500 water access areas. It's a lot of work to keep them in a, in a functional state for, for our, 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 all of our citizens. The fish passage rulemaking, this is really around fish screening, again, um, at the very base of our uh, salmon recovery, we've got to make sure that the fish are getting where they need to be and make sure they're not getting where they don't need to be. So we're going through our, an update on our rulemaking on that. And this supports the staffing to support that rulemaking that again supports the, the entire salmon recovery effort. And the last one, if I haven't bored you to death yet, is uh, monitoring recreational shellfish harvest. And this is uh, largely around crab, but I think there's a little bit, uh, there is a little bit of clam in there as well. This is similar to the other monitoring I've talked about, we have to make sure that we have a good precise estimate on the amount of shellfish we're harvesting. We work with our co-managers on their harvest and this allows us to make sure that we are, are harvesting at a responsible level and that we can uh, demonstrate to others that we are so that we can continue doing that. That's, that's it. I know it's a bit of a blitz. Uh, again, we'll make sure you have a connection or a link to all these in detail so you can see the specifics of how they, they roll up to these dollars. I think that was my slide for a while. Back to Brendan, who's muted. Back to Brendan, who's still muted. Oh, I was just. <laughs> Dang it. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so the first, uh, the first topic we're going to talk about tonight, uh, and by the way, thank you, Kelly. I don't know if you heard that part because I was muted. <laughs> Thanks for that update. I appreciate it. Uh, and we're going to uh, talk about North of Falcon. 
Um, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a confusing, can be a very confusing process. So we'll try our best to, to do a quick, brief description and overview of the process. Um, it's coming up here pretty soon, this, the start of it, and it, it's uh, something that reoccurs every year. So it's the name for the process that state, federal, and tribal fishery managers go through every year to set our commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, it's named after Cape Falcon, which you can hopefully see on the slide there. Um, just south of the Columbia River um, down in Oregon, and it's the fisheries north of Cape Falcon. And uh, the fishery managers must weigh many factors when developing salmon seasons. That includes our Endangered Species Act constraints, commission policy, uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty obligations, tribal co-management. So the Washington Treaty tribes manage their own fisheries, um, sharing data and splitting the harvest with the state. Um, extensive monitoring and evaluation of fisheries statewide. We, we have some of the most managed and, uh, and monitored fisheries in the world. So Washington State has got a, a big task ahead of it and it does a lot of work with that. Our folks do some fantastic work around that. Um, and so on the map, the, the International Pacific Salmon Commission is listed there and that's Canada and the US. Um, the Coastal Pacific uh, Fishery Management Council is the coastal fisheries and they do more than just salmon. So that, that council manages halibut and some ground fish and, and a lot of other species out there as well. And then the inner waters for Puget Sound um, and our immediate coast is, is managed through North of Falcon. And that's the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and our tribes, treaty tribes. Um, let me, uh, let's see, let's go on to the next slide, please talk a little bit about the timeline and, and both these slides I recognize are pretty uh, pretty busy and have a lot of a lot of stuff on them this one especially so we'll let this one sit up there a little while folks can take a look at it. Um, this is the timeline and the process. So the process starts uh, late February, early March and the first thing we do is try to forecast the abundance of each stock. Um, we, we determine if there's a harvestable surplus available. so in other words if there's enough fish, to come back and spawn that we have extras where we can actually afford to have a harvest on those fish. So conservation principles are in there first. Uh, then we, we propose the fisheries. Um, those fisheries are modeled to determine which stocks of conservation concern and which stocks are our constraining fisheries. So there's a lot of constraining stocks in, in our uh, sound that we are limiting, uh, limited due to the number of impacts we're allowed through ESA, uh, and so therefore it's pretty difficult to fish on a lot, of, a lot of our stocks, and they are the ones that limit the rest of the fishing on other stocks. When you catch a fish out in Puget Sound, you're not exactly sure if you're catching a fish from the Skagit, the Stillaguamish, it's, you know, it's difficult to determine where those fish are. They move around, and so we have to monitor very carefully to make sure that we're not impacting those constraining stocks past our legal uh, uh, impacts. Um, so we negotiate with the tribes and other states for a fair share of the catch and impacts on stocks that are constrained. The, uh, the final agreed to state and tribal salmon fisheries um, are, are for the ocean and Puget Sound in the north of Falcon. Um, the uh, co-management process of it, we, we include uh, monitoring and the seasons are implemented and, the, and then there's monitoring and we end up with what we call the, the loaf or an, a, a list of agreed fisheries. And then as those fisheries are prosecuted, uh, we, we monitor throughout the seasons with, with the tribes uh, and we determine to make sure that we're not exceeding our catches. Uh, let's see. So, and, and then the last bullet there is after the, uh, the PFMC meeting, we adopt those, those commercial and fishing regs. So NOAA, NOAA Fisheries has to sign off on that. So making sure we're not impacting ESA listed species. Uh, and then in June, which is, we're now down to about June, um, the here are public comments under the uh, APA or Administrative Procedure Act process. And then uh, the director, Director Suswin adopts state fishing regulations. Um, let's, uh, can we do the next slide, please? So how to participate. If you'd like to uh, participate in North the Falcon process, you can attend our public meetings. Um, and all that information is all on our website. If you go to fisheries management on the WDFW website, you can find where the public meetings are posted. Um, there's public meetings hosted every spring. 
and or you can provide comment online as proposals are developed throughout the process. Once salmon season are tentatively set. Um, we also engage with the public through our advisory group members. Um, we have different advisory groups. We have the Puget Sound Sport Fishing Advisory Group. We have the Puget Sound Steelhead uh, Angler, uh, Advisory Group. So we have various advisory groups and those are also places where the public can provide comment and, uh, and, and opinions around these fisheries and how we should manage them. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And we'd like to uh, remember a champion for salmon tribal fishing. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the legacy of our Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission chairperson uh, passed away in August um, in, in honor of uh, tribal uh, tradition where we will not mention her name, um, but you can see a, a, a great picture there on the screen. Hopefully you can see that. And uh, I strongly encourage you to go to Northwest uh, Treaty Tribes Magazine. And I think we're gonna put a link in the chat if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and there's some good articles there. You can also find a, just a, a wealth of information about her online. Um, miss, her, miss her and uh, miss her leadership and, and just a, been a, a really incredible icon in the Pacific Northwest uh, for, for generations. Okay, um, let's go on to our, our next topic. And this is the Southern Resident Killer Whale Recovery. So we're quite involved in Southern Resident Killer Whale with some promising news lately. Uh, there are three new uh, pregnancies documented in JPOD, um, but you know, we're optimistic, cautiously optimistic uh, about that. I think folks know that just because a, a female is pregnant doesn't necessarily mean we'll be successful in having a, a new calf. So keeping, keeping our fingers crossed there. Um, the number of these animals is now at 73. So that's very low. And so every new member we get is, is incredibly important. Um, they are amazing animals and uh, they help towards each, each new member helps towards the recovery of that population. So we're actively working on three factors affecting uh, orca recovery. Um, that's the, and they were identified in the, uh, the governor's task force a, a few years ago, uh, prey availability, the monitoring of diseases and contaminants and supporting quieter waters. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, uh, supporting available food or prey, um, restoring habitat is one of the greatest ways we can do that. We can uh, estuary restoration as well as restoration in the freshwater habitats really increase small numbers or uh, young baby fish that are out migrating to sea that will grow into adults that the, the uh, SRKWs can feed on. Um, another, another tool we use is removing barriers to fish migration. Um, we've been producing a lot more hatchery fish and, and the removing barriers to fish migration largely is uh, our culverts and uh, unscreened diversions and things like that. And so uh, Kelly mentioned some more money for, for screening and uh, fish passage, uh, fish barrier removal work. Um, so we're hopefully gonna get that from the ledge. Uh, let's see, producing more hatchery fish. We produced millions more hatchery Chinook this year in a number of our hatcheries in Puget Sound, specifically for uh, the Southern resident killer whale. Um, and we, we try and set seasons that allow the fishery to take place after those, those fish have passed through the feeding grounds or where the SRKWs are actually feeding. So we, we try and set in time and space these fisheries out so that the whales kind of get the first, first shot at the, at the fish and then the, uh, the anglers. So uh, setting those supported fishing seasons. Um, we're, and we're also just working to better understand and manage salmon predation. So there's a, a, a big um, push now for us to, to manage and or at least better understand the effects of uh, pinnipeds and avian predation on juvenile salmon and adult salmon. So we're trying to understand that and, and see how we can benefit the killer whales that way. Okay, next slide, please. And this is the monitoring diseases and contaminants. Um, we're, we are uh, conducting research with partners to understand the health and conditions of the individual Southern residents. Um, we work with the West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network um, to understand diseases and when, when whales are stranded, 
um, try and do necropsies and determine what the cause was of those uh, of the death of the animal and uh, identify any contaminants if they're present and hopefully identify the source of those contaminants um, and tracking diseases and parasites on individuals and then ongoing contaminant monitoring. And again, we try to try to identify the source of those contaminants so that we can somehow make a put a stop to that and make a difference there if possible. Okay, um, next slide. And then uh, quieter waters, quiet sound. So again, another uh, uh, bullet item that came or bucket that came out of the uh, task force was quieter waters. Um, so we work with quiet sound as an, it's an effort to better understand and reduce the effects of vessel noise on orcas. Um, it's also, we're working with um, Maritime Blue and they, and they are trying to understand how best we can conduct commercial vessel traffic as well to, to make a quieter sound. Um, noise, as folks probably know, interferes with their ability to feed and communicate with each other. And so foraging is, is greatly reduced in the presence of big vessels, um, as well as their communication with each other. So how, how best we can reduce that is, is a big, big challenge. Um, the whale report alert system is out there, and that helps ferries and other large vessels know when there might be orcas nearby. There's an app that you can download on your phone. So if you're out on the water, you can report uh, a whale and see and whale sightings. And then everyone that's got that can see where those whales are and they can put out an alert. So that's another one. Um, we've got the Be Whale Wise program, and uh, that's for boaters to give orcas space. So we want to make sure that folks are at least 400 yards in front of or in the rear of the path of travel of these uh, animals and at least 300 yards off to the sides. They also uh, need to be traveling when, when you're within a half nautical mile of the orcas, you need to be uh, doing seven knots or less. Uh, and so that's an, another way to keep the, keep the sound quieter. And then uh, as of May 1st, uh, 2021, we are requiring a commercial whale watching licenses. We went through the, uh, the process of creating a whale watching licensing system. And so now commercial whale watchers uh, are uh, receiving this license. And we are also trying to encourage the, the no-go zone. We're turning that into a, a travel zone on the west side of San Juan Island with a small, I believe it's a hundred yard corridor for kayakers but the west side of San Juan Island and Harold Strait is where a lot of the whales come through and where they commonly feed. So it's, a, it's an area in which there's a lot of boater and whale interaction. And so it's one place that we're really focusing on in, in North Puget Sound. Uh, let's see, I think we'll go to the next slide, please. And I think that was it. So now we get some time for some questions and answers. Um, and we really want to hear from you. So thanks for attending. And, and please, you can raise your hand and there's the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little hand and there's a great little graphic of it right there. Um, and so you can either raise your hand and take the question that and answer, ask your question that way, or you can put the questions into the chat um, using the Q&A function. Uh, and then if you joined by phone, the star nine will raise your hand and star six can be used to unmute yourself. And with that, I think we'll take some questions, please. So let me see what we've got. And I'm gonna ask the, the team to help me here. So I think what we're gonna do is I will try and go through and grab these questions and and Brendan, we do have someone um, who has their hand raised. So we'll we'll take uh, the verbal questions first, and then we can dive into the Q and A. Does that work for you? Sounds great. Okay, so Tony, I see um, your hand is up, so I'm going to unmute you on my end, and then you'll also need to unmute yourself. Okay, um, it's not letting me unmute you. Let's try this. Okay, Tony? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Tony. Hey, Brenda, this is uh, Tony Bakke from Linden, Washington. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Good to, good to see you, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Um, got some questions for you. Um, 
I'm almost 60 years old. I bought a fishing license probably since I've been about you know, 12 years old. Fished up here, crabbed up here, clammed up here, rockfish, you name it. What are you? What is WDFW going to do to get more opportunity for me and the recreational guys to buy a fishing crabbing uh, license next year? Well, we we are we are hoping you will buy. We have the uh, electronic licenses are going to be more available, as Kelly mentioned earlier. Um, we are we are putting out the salmon seasons going through the north of falcon process which i know you're you're familiar with tony and we will do our best depending on what the forecast of the runs return to have the best salmon fisheries we can and make the make the most available for you and the recreational opportunity out there and and maybe edward could i ask you to help me out with that question a little bit um, good evening, tony. thanks for calling in so what are we going to be doing Edward, we can't we can't hear you. Well, we can kind of hear you. You're a little muffled. Is that is that better? There you go. That's much better. Thank you. Yeah, it's having some feedback issues. Apologize for that. But Tony, what what we're doing, especially in the Nooksack, because that's whatever you're thinking about. You know, we're increasing Chinook there. We we took take took in uh, you know a record amount of Chinook there this year. We've increased coho production. You, we've increased chum production. And so every species of salmon has been increased on the nook sack. And so there's gonna be ample opportunity in the river for you to go fishing as well as the salt water, depending on if we can get all of our conservation concerns met. And so we're doing everything we can to make sure our conservation goals are met in each watershed. And, you know, on top of that, we're, we're releasing as many Chinook, Coho, Chum that can fit into that. So does that answer your question, Tony? And I'm sorry, I had to, I had to move Tony back into the attendee list. So um, I don't okay. think he... Okay. I'll have and, to unmute him, but we'll we'll have to keep going on to the next question too. All right. Sounds good. And th thank you, Edward. And and Tony, if you uh, if that didn't answer your question, reach out to Edward and myself, and we'll uh, we'll be sure and have the conversation with you and get you the answers you need. We'll meet, move on to um, I see B Tormy. I will unmute you on my end. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, my name is Bradley Tormey. I'm 11 years old and I have looked on the app and in the fishing rigs and I cannot seem to find Carpenter Creek and Sandy Creek. And I was wondering what the regs are for them. All right, Bradley. Hey, thank you so much. That's great questions. Um, I unfortunately don't know the answer to the, <laughs> the regs and I would have to try and look that up myself. Edward, do you by any chance know the, the answer to those? No. What what watershed are those creeks I, in? I'm curious. Is that the Skagit Carpenter Creek? All right. I think we lost Bradley. Um, but those are great questions. And I wrote it down and we will uh, we will get an answer to that. Um, Bradley, if you can hear me, if you could please put, to, put that in uh, or, or send that to the email at the directors, and then we can get that answer back to you. We'll, we'll find that out for you. Sandy and Carpenter. Thanks, Brendan. So now um, it'd be good for you to take some of the, the written questions there. Okay. And I see uh, I've got I'm backing up here, and I think the first question uh, we've got, so when will we know who is the new Skagit Wildlife Area Manager? And it's Martha Jordan. Hello, Martha. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Fenner to help me out with that. This is, this is in Fenner's program, and Martha uh, knows that we've had a recent change in staffing in the, in the uh, department in the Skagit Wildlife Area. So, Fenner, if you could help me out with that, that'd be great. Sure. 
Uh, thanks, Martha, for the question. Uh, yeah, the recruitment is on its way. It's working its way through HR. So uh, we'll have to do interviews and it'll have to be open. So we're hoping by the first of the year, uh, we'll have somebody in that really important position. So Martha, I can talk a little bit uh, with you offline at some point about kind of everything that's going on at Skagit. So, um, and keep you updated. All right, thanks for that, Gunnar. Um, second question, oh, it's Mar Martha also has a, a second question here. Has vandalism at our wildlife area sites gone, gone down or is it still bad after this summer? And, and raises a good point. There was a lot of that going on. The, the visitation, is, as uh, Kelly mentioned, we've just had incredible increase in use and visitation through uh, the COVID years, the last couple of years here. Um, and we have had some of that. So Fenner, can, can you help out with that? Sure. Um... It's still going on. Obviously, rainy weather and short days uh, make visitor use go down a little bit, but uh, use is still up, as the director mentioned, which is which is great and and a little challenging sometimes for our for our three field staff and over 140 sites. So um, we're doing we're doing everything we can. Um, it really helps when people report these type of things to us, so we can get on it quick. And um, it's probably a little less than it was during the the heart of the summer, but it, it's still going on. So. I hope that helps. All right, thanks, Fenner. Um, question, so why can't we tie the Discover Pass into the license plates or tabs instead of having it a separate hanging plaque from Randy? Um, and Kelly, I think that one might be, might be best up your alley. Uh, I might argue with you on that. <laughs> uh, actually, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. My first, and we'll check into it, that's obviously run through our, our DNR partners. My first thought would be making sure we get with the hanging tab, you can put two license plates on there. So how, making sure, you know, just the mechanics of it. But uh, it seems like a great, great idea. Actually, if we could make it work, it'd certainly be easier for you all. And then uh, I like it because I often get there and remember my Discover Pass was at home. So <laughs> it would help with that as well. You and me both. All right, question four. Hey, it's, it's uh, Senator Keith Wagner. Welcome, Senator Wagner. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Do you already have bill sponsors? Don't hesitate to ask. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I, I can't take that one, <laughs> Brendan. We, we are working with uh, senators and, and legislators, excuse me, the House of Representatives folks for, for sponsors. Uh, Tom McBride, our legislative liaison, is, is leading that up. And uh, I will make sure he realizes you made the offer and, and see if we can take you up on it. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. All right, question five. Uh, can you talk about the electronic license a bit more? Is this for hunting or fishing or salmon fishing? You want me to shoot at that one too, Brendan? I, yeah, since you talked about that one in the beginning, that'd be that's sure. Great. Uh, my answer would be yes. I hope it can be for all those things. There's no doubt that it's a lot more convenient. As I said, it's more real-time reporting. Uh, Oregon has, is in, in front of us, quite frankly, in this, which is great because they've learned a lot and we will plagiarize from them the best we can. Uh, th this is the environment we're going into. I would love to have it be available for fishing and hunting. Uh, we're, we're just now getting, we're not, we've been working on this for a while. Uh, through the COVID budget constraints, we got slowed down a little bit. We're going to speed back up, but uh, I believe we'd be looking at fishing first, particularly catch record cards, but we are interested in, in expanding it to, to all of our activities. Thank you. Okay, question uh, from Jet on Facebook. Wondering when we can hunt sea lions as salmon is their meal of choice and it's cheaper than breaching dams. And uh, I... <laughs> We, we currently cannot, you are, you are correct, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act prevents, prevents us to, uh, from, from harming uh, pinnipeds uh, as well as other marine mammals out there. There is no current plan now for hunting uh, marine mammals, but uh, we, are, we have been um, allowed uh, permits on the Columbia, and maybe I'd let Kelly speak to that a little bit, to take sea lions and do some predatory uh, sea lion and uh, Stellar's and California Sea Lion Control on the Columbia River. So we, we have received permits 
to do that. And so we are doing that down there. Um, and then in Puget Sound, we're conducting a lot of studies on pinnipeds to try and get a handle on uh, how many are there and how many uh, fish are they impacting. Specifically, we're looking at the Stiligwamish. We've got a study there going on um, where we're looking at numbers of sea lions and trying to ascertain what exactly is their diet. So we are we recognize that, that it's potentially a big problem um, for salmon, but we're trying to just collect data on that. And I don't know, Kelly, if you've had anything to add to that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you hit it pretty well, Brendan. Uh, as you said, we've we've increased our efforts down on the Columbia. That took a change in the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and it is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It's really tight. It's intended to be that. That was a decade long plus effort, and ending with a a, a a literal act of Congress to be able to have a little more flexibility in how those go about. We don't have that same availability in Puget Sound but we're making sure that we have all the science so i know people get worried or frustrated frankly that oh another study but we're never going to get through that maze of marine mammal protection act without all that data so what we're doing is making sure we have the foundation to determine when where and how you might do some management of those pinnipeds and and also be able to support that scientifically so we are working on that actively in Puget Sound. It is a concern. I think in Puget Sound, it's generally understood that it's it's uh, prey on smolts is the biggest hit in Puget Sound as opposed to adults uh, elsewhere. So, uh, and and we do we if you if you have questions, send it in, uh, and we can we can help you out. Yeah, please do. Thanks for that. We're also um, trying to do some avian monitoring as well. So we're we're aware that that uh, cormorants and, and um, terns, they can be a, a, a really make a big impact on small numbers as well. So there's been some research work going on that. Um, as Kelly said, you need to have the data before you can have a, ask for a, a change in a permit. Um, okay, question seven, uh, interested in bio, I'm interested in biomass and nutrient enhancement in the Skagit. Is there an opportunity for fishing clubs to help WDFW in this effort? Um, and I would refer to Edward on that one. I, I don't know specifically of any nutrient enhancement studies, but I, I do know there is some seeding of carcasses in the Skagit through uh, the harvest. But maybe Edward, could you uh, expand a little bit more on that maybe? Yeah, so I believe you're talking about nutrient enhancement through salmon carcasses and streams. And we've been working with um, CCA North Sound um, with Bob Cooper's group. And so if you could reach out to me or so I can give you that contact information, they'd probably love to help out with that. That work is currently um, going to be happening out of Marble Mount Salmon Hatchery and on the schedule. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Will the 1.3 million for salmon recovery overlap with the governor's upcoming salmon management plan? I think that one is uh, for you, Kelly. Sure. Th thanks, Brendan. Uh, the governor's salmon plan is just really coming out now, but absolutely, we've been. Uh, I can't give you the specifics. We don't have the specific specifics of the what uh, the governor's calling his three-year strategic salmon recovery plan now. Uh, but we are working with them and as they develop options, we will make sure I, it's certainly advantageous for us if it does, that just more support for, for the ask. Because of the state budgeting cycle though, we need to get our, our request in early. We typically have those over to the Office of Financial Management by August or September and uh, the governor's still working on his plan. So we, this, the things I identified were supplemental requests on our agency only as that plan from the governor comes out we will uh, we'll dovetail the two together, but uh, it certainly should be in that plan, but in, in the off chance it's not, we wanted to make sure we got our, our, our request in the queue. All right, thanks, Kelly. Okay, um, question, do you, do you have hope that we'll actually have healthy wild salmon population someday? Yes, absolutely, we have hope. Um, I, I would say, we are, that is exactly what we are striving to do here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. One of the, one of our biggest challenges and charges is to try and have a healthy uh, wild salmon population someday. Um, and, you know, with the, we have global climate change breathing down our necks. 
We've got a lot of different factors that affect the distribution of populations and densities of salmon. So it's very complex. Um, the, the management of salmon is very complex, but we certainly have hope and we are trying, trying everything we can to, to, to get to that point someday. Okay. Squid fishing is a very popular fall winter activity in this region, but catches have gotten off to a slow start this year. Any thoughts on what might be causing this or tips for squitters? And uh, I had also heard that. I had not been out squidding this year, but I had heard that the, the run seemed to be late in coming in. Edward, do you have any more uh, information than that? I really wish I did, Brendan. I'm a big squitter myself and been waiting for him to come back. And, um, you know, one of the theories is there's a beluga in the Puget Sound and maybe the beluga ate them all, but I, I really doubt that. And um, my hope is they're just late and, you know, it's just, we have ever changing environments in the Puget Sound. And, and so some years we'll see big abundances and other years we won't. And there's just a lot of unknowns because a lot of what happens in the, the, the ocean affects what's going on in the Puget Sound and vice versa. So I'm crossing my fingers. I got my squid jigs all sharpened up and I'm ready to go and hope to meet you out there on the pier. Thank you. All right. So a uh, question, do you collect data on how accurate your forecasting has been and have you made any changes in how forecasting is done based on that information? And I think that's kind of an adaptive management uh, question around forecasting and data. And yes, we do uh, collect data on that and we look back at our previous years of harvest and how accurately we modeled that. Um, I know recently that we've been changing the modeling to include some of those climate change variables um, in the North Pacific gyre, and that has increased our, our forecasting. So we are making adjustments to that. Um, and again, Edward, this one looks like if you have uh, better or more information than that, that'd be appreciated. Brendan, I think you summed that up really well. Um, part of the North of Falcon process is us looking at the past year and looking at our models and why did they perform? Why did they not perform? And typically on any given salmon run, we'll be running five or six different models to see which one performs the best and looking at past performance. And as Brendan mentioned, like climate change and other variables that will feed in there. So um, it's something that we, we put a lot of rigor into, but, you know, do, do we have a, did this forecast perform better than that forecast and you know did I get an A, B or a C? Not really. We just kind of you know look at it all and, and, and put it all back together if that makes sense. Right. Thank, thanks Edward. Thanks for that. Um, I lost my place. Here we are. Brendan, could I interrupt you just to see if we could take a, um, a verbal question here? Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Thanks, okay, Rachel. Great. I see Michael Hayes that you have your hand up. I will unmute you on my end and ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, how the Game Before Evan is adapting to this type of communication. It's very important. Uh, Chuck, uh, I believe you may be a part of the uh, Trig uh, group, the environmental trig group is overlooking uh, a number of projects in eastern Santa Fe, uh, largely that are largely funded by PSC. There's a particular uh, patch of uh, the largest really elk preserve that was created uh, is right next to my property, uh, and the uh, just from a layman's point of view, I thought the, uh, uh, what we've done back in the forest was absolutely wonderful. I think the PSC uh, team, uh, everybody in the trip, uh, which includes the tribe, uh, the game department, of course, the game department, but uh, uh, I never agree. And they did a really good job. I'm wondering, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, is, as far as you know, is that project complete? Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to get information about these types of projects. I live real next, uh, close to it, so I'm, I'm very interested in this information. If you could share anything about uh, any type of developed future, uh, near-term, uh, medium, 
long-term uh, future development as far as environmental um, uh, uh, work to compensate for the upsets of land in this area. As Michael, a landowner, uh, as Michael a landowner, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to hear you, Michael. I'm, I'm thinking that the panel is having a hard time hearing you as well, but I think your question is about um, the PSE Elk Preserve work. Uh, is that tr is that right? Well, it's PSE, uh, the game department, uh, uh, along with the tribe, uh, along with the Rocky Mountain Elk Preserve, uh, they created an elk preserve to pull elk up away from Highway 20. And uh, it was wonderfully done, executed over, uh, quite, you know, I think it's been a decade now the work's been, uh, you know, slowly but surely, you know, moving forward. Uh, I'm wondering if he has, if Chuck has any knowledge as to whether they consider that a complete work of art. I consider it a nice work of art, but he consider it a complete work of art. Yeah, Michael. Go for it, Chuck. All right, thanks. Yeah, Michael, I, uh, I am, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the PSC work that they're doing up there. Uh, I, I know it's on my short list of things to be looking into uh, generally on their license, but I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, because I really didn't hear most of your question, you know, I'm, I'd be happy to uh, take a call from you offline and, and have a conversation with you about that. Uh, and I, and I know and I'm, I'm going to pass it over here to Fenner, too, because I, he might know a little bit more. Uh, I know he knows, does a lot with elk in this gadget. So. Yeah, Michael, I do, I do know a little bit about it. It is, it is ongoing. It's still, um, they're still working on it. Um, they collared a lot of elk up there. And so we've got some pretty good data from PSC and our tribal co-managers of elk coming in and out of that area and using it. There are some progress reports that PSC has and is prepared. Um, so if you want to get in touch with me, get me your contact information, I can pass those on to you. It kind of uh, documents elk movements, um, elk use, and kind of how all of their forage enhancements, if they were successful or not. So pretty cool project. Um, there's a lot of information out there that I can absolutely get to you. All right. Thank you, Fenner and Chuck. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's see. Have you looked into using, uh, this is another question in chat. Have you looked into using the developing sonar technology to accurately collect returning salmon data in the rivers? The tribes and Alaska uses it. Um, yes, we do employ that in certain areas. There, there is, we've, we've been having some problems with some of the equipment we've used. I know at, a couple of our hatcheries, there are, there are some uh, electronic detection uh, devices. But again, I think Edward probably has much better information as Edward comes from our, our originally our hatchery world and has excellent, excellent information on that experience. Sure, Brendan. Um, the question I'm just struggling with a little bit um, was the question about sonar in the rivers or in the hatcheries? I, I, just... I think to collect returning salmon data in the rivers. So sonar, okay. sonar in, the, in the rivers. Yep. Yeah, so a couple things here. One thing, um, just want to give a plug to the Quicksilver um, package that came through our Puget Sound Steelhead Advisory Group um, lobbied for some funding and we, we got money to kind of take a deep dive and, and, and look into this because we know sonar is the direction we need to go to figure out fish coming in. And, and um, we have some, you know, sonar in place like in the Elwha and the Dungeness on small scale. But what we're looking for is going big. We want to do it on the Skagit. And um, we have partners with Seattle City Light. We have partners with uh, Upper Skagit Tribe, Swinomish, and Sauk Seattle. And um, we're going to try and make this a reality in the next few years because it's really difficult to, to you know, gauge how many sockeye are coming in the Skagit, how many Chinook, you know, and as fishery managers, that's critical information we need to know as we're trying to conserve other stocks. And so we're, we're going big on it, on the Skagit, and we're also going to be looking into it on the Stillaguamish as well in the next few years. So we're really excited. We're, we're going to be moving into the future. 
and um, hopefully we'll be able to get a better handle on what's going on in our rivers that we're trying to protect. Right. Thank you, Edward. Great question. Um, so uh, I'm noticing we're getting at seven o'clock here, so it's probably running. We're running out of time. So maybe just uh, one, one or two more questions. Um, here's one from Facebook. What about herring and other forage fish? Any restoration projects there? Um, and there are some beach restoration projects going on in Puget Sound. We're also really uh, pushing our shore friendly uh, program for bulkhead removal and we have some new uh, wax around how, how we can uh, help landowners and provide some incentives around how we can help landowners to uh, do the right thing and remove hardened armored bulkheads and try and do some more soft shore. But it's really uh, Chuck's arena. So Chuck, if you have uh, any, any more information on that, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Uh, <clears throat> I think you, you covered it pretty good. Uh, we do uh, we do considerable work helping landowners along the sound with uh, their construction of bulkheads, and uh, you know that work uh, we've been refining quite a bit through the legislative process, but also through our uh, through our hydraulic authority and uh, having having landowners consider different options for these these types of structures because. We know that the bulkheads really impact uh, forage fish uh, production, and so we so we're trying to or we're working towards being much more successful and at least managing the impacts from a construction standpoint. Great, thanks, Chuck. Really great questions tonight. Fantastic, I appreciate it, and thanks for engaging. Um, I want to wrap us up by just inviting folks to reach out to us with any further questions on the the. Uh, email addresses and or phone numbers were posted, contact information posted in the chat. So please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, customer service staff and, and all of us will be happy to answer your questions as best we can. And uh, thanks very much for attending. I really appreciate it. And Kelly, do you have any, uh, any, any final wrap up you wanna, you wanna give us? Well, I, just that I see there's quite a few questions we didn't get to, and that's unfortunate. Well, it's actually wonderful because that means we've got some engagement and we, we've got a lot more to say. So uh, just make sure those questions we got a way to get back to, and we'll make sure that those all are answered. And if you thought of additional questions during the, the presentation or the question and answers session, just send them into the email links that are shown there, uh, director at dfw.wa.gov. is We'll get you to any place we need to get to, and we'll get you an answer for sure. I really appreciate folks taking time out of their busy schedule. I know uh, you got a lot going on and it means a lot to us that you would take the time to spend this evening with us. And uh, we obviously need to get back here soon. We got a lot of questions to, to address and I really like doing those in a live format. Uh, it just seems a little more responsive. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to the great crew here. You got, you do have a great crew in, in DFW here in region four. Uh, Quite a challenging region. They all are in different ways. This certainly is the metropolitan region uh, with growing populations, climate change. We've got our, our hands full here and we've got the right crew to do it. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. And that's it. That's it for me, Brendan. All right. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, really appreciate it and have a great evening. <laughs>